I work with people that have a big vision. Mm -hmm. There's always something they want to achieve. And what they realize is there's always a safe work and unsafe work. The safe work is I sit at home and I make a, a web, you know, website and I build it and I make these things look pretty. The unsafe and scary work is putting it into the world and getting judged. This is the Gold Medal Mindset, where we bring you all things winning in business, sport, and life. I'm Dr. Jason Richardson, pro BMX world champion and Pan Am Games gold medalist. Now I'm a professional speaker, author, and winning mindset coach. Thanks for joining in. Get ready to mind for gold as we challenge your perception to change your results. Thanks for joining in on the Gold Medal Mindset. And as you know, I'm super excited to have this guest, former... NFL player, we were just talking about that word former. We'll probably get to that. Mr. Anthony Trucks, trust your hustle, American ninja warrior, all of the above, business consultant, speaker. Saw this gentleman speak in September. He brought down the house and just happened to have the same amount of slides as the number he used to wear on his back on the field. Thought that was a pretty cool touch. Anthony Trucks, how you doing, man? I'm doing very well, man. Did I have that many slides? Yeah, you I did you, have a lot of slides. You, not you, words, though. No, 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 not words. And you, you added that one slide. You said at the end of your at the end of your talk, you said I had to add this one in because as you were building it, you said there was one more <laughs> slide. So you just added one more slide, so you had the same amount as your number. So. Yeah, I did do that. I actually do better speaking without slides. When you have four iMag screens, you got to do something with them. Apparently. And and it speaks to yeah. you quite well if you can do it without slides because really what what you have to say you're you're the person up there right yeah if you just can can convey what needs to be conveyed it's like if you're good with movement and you understand how to uh, how to I guess listen to the audience and, and play off them it's I think it's more of a conversation that way as opposed to here talk listen to me and then look at that and then listen to me and then look at that and so put it back and forth but actually it it takes some time to figure out how to speak without slides without going off track. Right. Yes, because you could go on a tangent, which we'll probably do on this show. Um, yeah, we're already doing it. We're already doing it because we're like already off base. Okay, back. <laughs> <laughs> this is that was like his nice way of cracking the whip. So, so Anthony Trucks also. Oh owns, no, I'm oh, yeah, that's, a, that, that's cool. That's it. So he also owns a gym, and he goes into the corporations, and he gets people in the shape so they can do the best at their job. So that was kind of his nice way of saying, "Hey, man, my time is valuable. Let's get to it." All right. So trust your hustle. I love it, um, and I like that you use the word trust because that's a big word that comes up. And you know, as an athlete, you know, trusting that your training's enough, trusting that your coach is there, trusting that the play is going to work, whatever it is, trusting your own ability, you know, that that you can that you can run that route, whatever it is. That is a huge word because when we get on stage, whatever stage that is. That fear, that doubt comes in. So I love that you use the word trust your hustle. And I'm just going to get right to it. What's the one thing that you think um, that you – so so you, you work with a lot of people. You speak in front of thousands of people. You've touched a lot of people over the course of your journey and what you do. What's mm -hmm. kind of – what are the, what are the I guess, the, the, the one or two thing, common things that you see with most everybody when you, when you do what you do? Yeah. So th the biggest thing I see is uh, is excuses. Excuses are these things that people make up without even realizing they make them up. And what I mean by that is in order to create or do or kind of be bigger now, you have to do something that's going to be incredibly uncomfortable. And this is everybody. I don't care if you have to learn a new task. You have to you know, talk to someone you're uncomfortable talking to. You're embarrassed. You're shy. You to, whatever that aspect for you is, there's an incredibly deep problem with a lot of people of, uh, of really kind of not understanding how to step into that role. And so uh, I think when we get to that place, it, it's tough. The biggest thing that underlies it is trust. And so we'll make excuses in life and we'll say, you know, I can't do this because I didn't have time. I didn't have to know this is skill set or I'm too old or I've been doing this too long. And so we get stuck in this area and we make a great excuse that though it may be an incredible excuse, like a great excuse. Like I'll sit back and believe like, well, maybe this person legitimately didn't have time or maybe they don't have enough for this, this coaching or this education, whatever it might be. It still is segmenting you from your dream. Mm. No matter what it is, good or bad. You still are no closer to where you want to be. And this, this is underlined in the bottom part by this trust aspect. And, and so I like that you you brought up trust because I think a lot of the world we live in today is telling everybody that there's something wrong with you. And you don't have this much information or you you, you got to go get this to get better. If you don't have this, you're going to be you know messed up or, you know, go buy shoes on Black Friday and Cyber Monday because it'll make you, you know. So 
everywhere we walk, we're being told that we are lacking something. And trust tells us that there's something inside our It's the difference. And so when we look at the, the aspect of excuses, we're, we're living in that, that kind of world that's telling us something wrong and missing an excuse to make it okay so we can go to sleep at night not hating ourselves for not making progress. And so it's a weird thing there. And so what trust does is, is where you have to actually be able to tap into what you've got uh, internally in you and believe you're capable of doing something. But it's it's a muscle. And for a lot of people, it's weak and they've never worked it out. And so they never had this trust over time and they'll cloud it and, and cover it up with a bunch of excuses. Now you just open up a big can. And so and we're going to get to your backstory first because I I like excuses. I wrote down in my notes excuses, and I just wrote excuses equals beliefs. And I always tell people, and I say there's a lie inside of every belief. So you spell out the word belief, B-E-L-I-E-F, right? There's a lie inside every yeah. belief. And what I like about that is yeah. you can choose what you want to tell yourself. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm I'm going to be a world champion BMX racer. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm playing in the NFL. Might not be yeah. true at the age of 12 or 8. However, by the time you're 22 or 28, those things can come to fruition, right? Those those beliefs yeah. actually become the truth. So I, I like I like that you worked with excuses, and it's interesting because you said something about we get really good, we don't even realize we're making excuses. So what are those mm -hmm. for the people listening? What are those? Because I want I want. I want to stick the knife in since you're since you're a trainer and I'm a trainer <laughs> of sports. I really want to stick yeah. the knife in and twist today. What are those excuses yeah. that people uh, think is 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 rationale versus or 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 come you know they're exercising good decision making versus actually what are those excuses yeah. that people don't realize are excuses? Well, the, the problem is is everybody uh, the excuses you hear will be different based on mm -hmm. who you're talking to because you'll know what they'll accept. So if yeah. I'm talking to you and I have an excuse, like knowing your, your background, what you got going on as, a, as an athlete, I can tell you, oh, man, you're beat up a little bit. Or I don't have enough time. I'm, I'm draining energy. I can make something up that would that would be convincing to you. So the excuses truthfully change. Like, so, based on the audience. It's serious. And people think that it's different, but it's not. Unless it's a legitimate, like, I broke my leg. I can't run today. That That's different from an excuse. Well, that's a circumstance, know, right? That's a it's circumstance. Exact, it's different. Totally different. But when – when it comes to the people I work with, I work with people that have a big vision. Mm -hmm. There's always something they want to achieve. And what they realize is there's always a safe work and unsafe work. The safe work is I sit at home and I make a, a web, you know, website and I build it and I make these things look pretty. The unsafe and scary work is putting it into the world and getting judged. Mm -hmm. What people do is they have these visions and they find ways to protect themselves from the pain of judgment. And, and the excuses they make are usually ones that will pull them away from whatever the work is that needs to be done out into the world you don't see people struggling in the backside to create something and think of a vision or sit it you know around a, a table somewhere and talk about their dream you see them struggle to make it put it into the world and that's kind of where the excuses people make they don't realize they're making is you know i don't have enough time i got this this thing i want to get done but you know i just between work and between you know you know doing the stuff with the kids and my wife i have no time and so i'll sit back and i literally just listen to them talk for a while and then i sit down and, and i start with the same question is so why do you keep telling people you want to do that? Well, what do you mean? Well, when you keep telling me about you wanting to get this done, but but you're making a great excuse. No, no, I really have this time to do, and I don't have it. Okay, so let's let's break this down. Let's say how, about how many hours will that take you to do? Let's just mm -hmm. throw a number out there. Let's say, could you get it done in ten hours? Yeah, I could probably get it done in ten hours. Okay, cool. Do you find at any point in time in your day thirty minutes that you can do something? That you're, you know, maybe you're Facebooking, maybe you're sitting there watching a TV show. Pull out. If I asked you to for a really good reason, 30 minutes. Well, yeah. OK, cool. So if you do that for 30 days, you're going to have more than 10 hours of time, which means you will have completed your project you wanted to get done. So what you're telling me is, is whatever it may be is the reason of, of time. It's not that you don't you know, have the time to do it. It's that the time that you have, you don't want to allocate towards it. And there's a great saying of Robin Sharma. He says, the time that ordinary people waste, extraordinary people leverage. Mm. And so okay. inside that, it's like, well, if you want to be, if you want to have extraordinary things, which is going to be something different than the rigmarole and what the world has, you got to be extraordinary, which means you have to be extraordinary with your time. And so it's like some of the basic excuses I get. And honestly, it's a, it's a mental shift because now when I tell you that, you're like, oh, well, yeah, maybe I could, you know, half hour out a day. And you can, if planned right, if you have the right structure and organization and you get it all done, you'll find that you'll probably get something done faster than 10 hours. Because we, in our head, we have a weird way of making things seem longer than they actually are. Mm -hmm. Like when it's like, oh, I got to get a workout in the day. In our head, the workout's a three hour ordeal. 
when really it's like 45 minutes, we're done. Shower and everything sometimes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so just having that kind of concept based around it, you can get people to shift. And now here's where the thing we talked about trust, right? In the beginning, part of it is they don't trust themselves to get it done. They don't trust to put it out there. So it's kind of like this, this standoffishness. Once they've completed it and they've put it out there and someone says, hey, great job, it shifts. Now it's like, oh, somebody like this thing. Like m- maybe I can do this. And now you start seeing that little trust will grow a little bit over time. I like to lead out with behavior as well. Um, You know, it takes a little bit of a nudge to kind of shift that perspective. And then it's like, okay, Mm -hmm. let's attach a behavior to that. And then just just do that, right? And then over time, those results, you kind of shift that cycle. Um, You you had a lot of good nuggets in there. Uh, I literally just did a post today to my Facebook group about one day. And I said, Mm -hmm. that's my least favorite day of the week is one. (laughs) <laughs> it's <Yeah>. one day because <laughs> it's one day I will or or it would be nice if and I just was like I think the title of it was 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 save yourself like like yeah. just just save yourself the heartache save yourself the conflict if you find yourself saying one day I'll do and 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 it'd be nice if I I mean I get it might be like your little mental vacation from mm-hmm. whatever it is that you're doing but really if you really want to do that then wouldn't you be doing that or or is, or is sure. having that in the back pocket enough for you that's i think it's a it's shelf esteem people like putting it up on the shelf and say look what i'm gonna do and people are like oh it looks like it's gonna be amazing and shelf then you feel esteem. fulfilled a little bit that's good that's good so in, in the psychology world we say don't should on yourself yeah yeah <laughs> so yeah, I, I get you it should be doing that you should be doing that all right so who is this dude, Anthony Trucks, who comes on the show and just starts dropping bombs within like the first 10 minutes? <laughs> Let's get some backstory on you because I think people will be, well, I think they'll like it. I think they'll, they'll be interested to know. So, so I'll just let you yeah. take it away, and I, I, but, I'll, but I'll lead you in because I know it started with a vivid memory at three years yeah. old. Mm-hmm. It did start. So uh, I, I tell people in the world of what I you know do is is I'm big on creation. Like it, that that day one. If you go to my my gym website, because actually on a gym is uh, it says day one or one day. Mm. And literally, it's like you need to choose. It's either going to be day one for you, or it's going to be one day you'll get it done. So I I believe that for me that all started at the same time. Like when I was a kid, like I oddly became an entrepreneur at three years old. And it sounds odd, and, and what it means is it's a simple thing. For me, my first memory is being given away in foster care. Uh, my biological mom gave me and my three siblings away. She didn't care about us, I guess, didn't love us, and just wanted us gone. And so that first memory of my life is feeling kind of lost, a little bit mm-hmm. um, you know, downtrodden, not accepted, like where I felt like I'm on an island, which is the exact same feeling that a person that creates something wants to put something in the world feels. Like, yep. <laughs> like I'm sure when you start your podcast, you're like, is anybody going to listen to this? <laughs> swimming. The- <laughs> I'm swimming, and there's no yeah. land. Exactly. It's a scary thing. And even if it's not an entrepreneur, I mean, I think that word can be shifted in a lot of ways because just because you don't do, you know, only your, if you have a job, regular job and you start something on the side that it's a passion project, it's the same thing. You know, you're starting something. Mm-hmm. So from there, I progressed on in life. And uh, for the next three years, I was bounced around from foster home to foster home. I was, I was beaten, starved and tortured, a lot of weird things from a lot of different bad people. At the time, the foster care system was a system where as long as you don't die, like it's my paycheck. You know, mm-hmm. They pay people to have me live there, and they just they didn't feed me, didn't clothe me. I ended up at six years old, uh, finally getting moved into a house, which is my home now. And unique thing in that is I'm the only black person in an all white family, so I have this weird diversity thing mm-hmm. growing up. Like to this day, it's funny when people are like, "Oh, who's your dad?" and I show them pictures, like, "Ah, uh, okay." <laughs> like I got all my cousins will tell people like that saw the American Ninja Warrior TV show. They're like, "Oh, it's my cousin." And they're like, "Are you sure?" <laughs> <Did> somebody, somebody <laughs> it can't be. It can't be. Yeah. So I got to the age of 14 and from, you know, six to 14, like as in this family, we had a lot of ups and downs. We were very poor. Uh, my first foster dad was a drunk, a lot of craziness. So I just endured a, a kind of a crappy childhood there. And then my mom remarried and she got this, you know, good guy married and he was doing well. We were kind of making more income as a family, we're moving into a nicer house. And it got to this point where like around 12, 13, life is getting better, but I'm getting incredibly scared because mm-hmm. I'm still in foster care, which mm. means any day without notice, I can be moved. So I never knew if that head, you know, pillow I put my head down on last night is going to be the same one I put my head down on tomorrow night mm-hmm. for years. And so at 14, I stood up in front of a judge and looked my real mom in her eyes. And I said, I no longer want you to be my mom anymore. And I severed my parental rights with her and got adopted and it shifted everything a little bit. Uh, I got to go do something that a lot of people, you know, took for granted, I guess, or still do. And, and for me, it was like this life changing day. I had to play football. 
Like it, it was the sport that for the first time ever something gave me a, a really good sense of. Wait, you started playing football at fourteen? Fourteen, man. I was late in the game. That's freshman in high school. Freshman in high so school. So most kids that played, they did their they did their flag or they did their pop Warner. Yeah, and, and I'd you, never done anything. Oh, uh, okay. Keep going. No organized football. Yeah, yeah right. it was a serious thing. A lot of people are like, how'd you do that? And I ended up making the NFL like that. I, that's a whole other weird part of my life, I guess. But uh, yeah, man, so I get to this point. This is really crazy. Like, I guess the, the second level I know everybody gets to, the second emotion I know every, honestly, every person gets to, uh, is uh, I got to this point where my adoptive mom, a guy that was multiple multiple sclerosis. Uh, my older brother went off to the military, kind of left me hanging around. Uh, I myself was kind of doing poorly in football. I love the game, love the game, but I sucked. Like I, <laughs> I, I couldn't do anything. I just tackle people and I tackle the wrong guys sometimes. It was hilarious. So, uh, so I get to this point where I have this feeling of there's something that, that you love, but you're not doing well. So you find an excuse or a way to chalk it up. Uh, okay. What was lot, your excuse? And we, my excuse was I'm a foster kid. You know, I'm not supposed uh, to do great life. You know, that was my thing. And, and I love this, but, you know, I wasn't – I wasn't. so when you're not doing well at something that you love, you don't want to mess it up. So you kind of find a way to stop doing it as much or you find a way to round it. So, you know, there's people that want to be – I want to be a writer. And then, so they write and their book sucks. So they stop writing, you know. Or I want to be a speaker, but, you know, they can't get booked and nobody, you know, speaks to them. So they find, oh, well, I had to work something else. Like they find ways – to, to cop out when really their dream is still sitting inside of them and they're trying to box it into an area hopefully to go away and it doesn't. Mm -hmm. So I remember I'm sitting here and it took one statement to shift everything for me is that my excuse wasn't good enough. And this is what I think a lot of people need to, to, to tune into if they're tuning in anything here. I'm sitting in this, this uh, portable. It was my English class, Mr. Howell's English class, back right corner. Shout and out there's Mr. two Howell. Sitting next. Hey, Mr. Howell. Same day as me too. Ah. Oh, there so, we go. Uh, we're we're in this class and I'm I'm pretty much sleeping in class at a black park I put over my head. There's these two girls sitting next to me and they're just talking to each other and they have no idea I'm listening. But one, one girl says the other girl, well the reason I'm so bad is because I'm in foster care. And it was like this statement that just bah, hit me, and it sunk so deeply in because I know I may not have ever said that out loud. But I know in the back of my head, I'm thinking, well, even all my life, like I'm just this foster kid. Nobody cares about me. Like I'm adopted, but like it's just, you know, this not really by my real family. You have these weird little stories you tell mm -hmm. yourself to justify why you can give up on your dream. So I'm sitting there and I remember it just it stuck with me all day. And I went home and I sat in my room and I remember like standing up and look at this mirror that I had in my, my room. And I'm just looking across and I stared like right in my own eyes and I said, you're going to be great had no idea what it meant. Like I literally this day, I'm, I'm like, why did I decide to say that? <laughs> like <laughs> super awkward, but it shifted everything. And so for me, I had this internal decision that was the best decision was I was going to put in more work than I'd ever imagined before I knew I'd be successful. Wow. Decision that shifted everything. And at that point, I went, I mean, I, I knew I could be great at football is what my goal was. So I started lifting all the weights I could lift. I started running routes to the park with buddies. I had no idea what I was doing, but I wanted to get so good at just, you know, understanding my body and how the sport was played and doing all the work I could that I had a chance to be successful. Mm -hmm. That's the thing is I didn't, I didn't know for sure. Nobody does. But, but you got to give yourself the best chance and making excuses and not doing the work does not give you a chance. It's just pretty much you're, you're hoping and hoping doesn't get much done sometimes, sadly. So for me, I put this work in and I showed up the next year like an animal. Like I was I was mad because I had this thought in my head that I had done way too much work to prepare for this to allow you to beat me at anything, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. anything. And it showed up. I, I was meaner, faster, stronger. I did. I didn't quit. There's nothing that was going to quit. And so, what I did is that that year I ended up going from uh, it was my sophomore year. Now mm -hmm. I went up to varsity uh, as, a, as a true sophomore. As a sophomore, uh, a couple years later, I got a football scholarship and um, played at University of Oregon for a few years. I ended up there for four years. And my fifth year went on to play in the NFL. Played for the Buccaneers, Redskins, and Steelers. Uh, since then, I've progressed on and I've I've opened my own gym, which we talked about back in 08. My first business is still intact and running, uh, which was not supposed to happen. I opened in 08, which is the worst time. That's to open the best business. time ever, right? <laughs> <laughs> like the economy was done, and so I opened that, and ran that. Then I started consulting and making you know over a quarter million dollars consulting. I, I uh, I've written books, I've traveled, I've spoken, I've done a whole bunch of weird, crazy things. Even American Ninja Warrior, and I look back on all these these moments of my life, and I realize that. The reason they all took place is because I, I learned something in that small segment of time at the age of 15 to 16, more like 15 to 18, was 
I'm going to try to put this work, be great at something before I know it's going to be great. And I did that and then it, it succeeded. And I was like, well, if I can do this in a football field, can I do this in life? Mm. And that was kind of the big shift. I was like, well, wh- what did I do? And what I did was I got to this point where I started working at something. I got good at it. I applied it. And I just kept pushing them a little bit more and a little bit more, which is where the whole message of my company, Trust Your Hustle, came from. Ah, okay. <laughs> so you got me on hype right now. It's in my office yeah. on hype. So this, because when I work with athletes, this is the big, and you probably know better than anyone, <sighs> You work with someone and they have rings, they have championships, they have world titles, they've amassed a lot of money in the sport. And then three years later, whatever it is, it's like they're bitter, angry, broke, whatever it is, like the world owes them something. And like... I think that's probably like the the one of the bigger reasons why I got into psychology and, and went about it the way I went about it. Because I was like, wait, like there's too much good stuff in this professional athlete life. And I'm not talking about the travel and, and money you make and doing something you love because you don't always love mm-hmm. it that time. But it, it's what you're talking about using that hustle, mm-hmm. that mindset and applying it to anything else. And it's so – interesting to me that somebody could literally be sitting on top of the world literally with olympic gold or whatever it is and their excuse is i'm only an athlete i'm just an athlete i'm just a jock and it's like no (laughs) you're not (laughs) i mean if Mm -hmm. if, you know you you can you're actually more right you're that and you're that and and so when you're just like so I, I had to I had to do the time out because and really beat this down because there are a lot of um you know a lot of my my uh, endemic following are BMX racers, um, mm-hmm. and I and I have to preach this to to athletes or anybody who's transitioning out of something and into something else is that you are that and more. Like yeah, more like than you, you know, because you you take all of that with you, right? And it's just a matter of mm-hmm. leveraging it. So, anyways, yeah, I'm off. I the think soap for me, box. one of the no, I like the soapbox. I think that's that is life. This is what we're here for right now. This is yeah. somebody's listening to this and they need to hear this. And I I don't want to move on because I know there's something within that that I'm always trying to the exact same way as pull it out because a lot of people think that that's all I am, but. But there's a lot of the people I've run into in the world now, whether it's corporate people or just everyday moms and dads, it's a lot of them, the, the mindset's the lacking piece. They got information, but think about how they got the information or experience. They did it lackluster, kind of lazily, like that was just the Passively. next step. Passively. Yeah, they just kind of did it. And so what we do is we come out of the sports world and say, oh, well, I, I don't know what this person knows. I haven't been in the, in the industry as long as they have. Yeah, but if you take even a, a, a quarter of the intangibles you have from the, the work ethic, the drive, the application, the ability to take a step and not be afraid of every mm-hmm. single step you take, the you'll willing, be able to buy- The willingness to get hit, literally. Yeah, you, you'll bypass them. You, you'll, you'll literally, you'll leaps and bounds move past them because they're, they're, there's more to it than just the information. And we as athletes have- We've taken all this stuff we've done in life and we've said, oh, it's just for that sport. But it, I don't know why people separate this, but what you did physically only because of the mental. So if you can step back and say, how did my mind push me to get up in the morning at five, six, seven in the morning? How did my mind push me past this pain, physical pain? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, How was I able to learn this skill set when it was so hard and I took 50 million reps at it to get it figured out to be the greatest, right? You take just that mindset, unplug it, plug it in somewhere else and say, well, how can I learn to speak? How can I learn to write a book? How can I learn to run a company? How can I learn to be a great husband, a great father? How can I learn these different aspects, applying the same like skill set? honestly people fly like when they do that they fly and i think a lot of athletes they they get done and they can't figure out the the next step that's going to give them the same high that they had when they're playing the sport but really it's a chemical thing so if Mm -hmm. you can find something that you really are passionate about apply those mindset like those tools you already got they're already there Mm -hmm. you got every the the thing switched so quickly and now they find that passion that purpose and then they can move and that's how you see some athletes killing it in their own life after sports because they found something to kill it for yeah, yeah, and you know the other thing too is I've noticed when you let me back up. I think the other piece of that from an athletic perspective is because it is so physical, it's regardless of win, lose or draw, there is that immediate 
physiological chemical endorphin mm-hmm. thing like you know you're getting it on you, you yeah. might have lost the game but but you got your hits in you got your reps in you got like there is a physical piece where it's just like yeah i actually moved that weight right mm-hmm. it wasn't the best day in my gym but i moved that weight and there's yeah. a there's a there's a visceral visceral reaction and so that when you when you get out of that and you're sitting at the dinner table and you're talking to wife's friend's husband number five about Mm -hmm. how to get to work without (laughs) hitting traffic or whatever you're like you know and you were on a plane like you know a year ago or whatever it was doing your thing it's like uh, you know that's not the same (sighs) that's not the same that's not the same thing but when you find or you exercise that passion in whatever it is you do whether it's physical or otherwise you can get that same rush and then too Mm -hmm. That's not to say that you can't be physical in other aspects, right? Because I yeah. find I find like in the corporate world, the way I get st- stuff out of people is I get them, oddly enough, moving. I stretch them physically a bit, especially if you come to my office and train with me. I'm going to stretch you physically a bit mm-hmm. enough so that you can see what your threshold is or find a new threshold. It's really mm-hmm. simple. Um, I had a uh, an acupuncture do uh, acupuncturist. Uh, guy do this with me but you know you kind of get about on the you kind of get put your back toward a wall and then you twist Mm -hmm. and try to touch your hands to the wall and then naturally Mm -hmm. you know you don't go that far but then the next time you do it you go a little bit further and it's it's really simple and stupid and he was actually testing Mm -hmm. my posture or something like that but i was like wow i can actually use this (laughs) yeah as a as a as a a quick card trick you know Mm -hmm. when i'm speaking to find people because there is a disconnect I think, um, you know, athletes with sometimes the, the cerebral aspects or some of those soft skills you were talking about, but then too, mm-hmm. with, you know, the, maybe the non-professional athlete, but the, you know, the, the, the traditional worker, we'll say the traditional, mm-hmm. uh, executive with, yeah. with their physical self, but, but we know mind, body, spirit, business, life, sport, it's all, it's Don't all connected. It. It's all connected. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. okay, I'm sorry. I, we, but to beat that point, see, that was a tangent, people. Sorry about that. But that it, had, tangent, to, it had to be said because there was lessons learned in that. So, okay, so mm-hmm. now you came back hungry. It's 10th grade. You're smashing people. You're, you're on the varsity team as a 10th grader. You went to the NFL. or went to, wait, U- University of Oregon. Three Oregon, NFL yeah. teams. Mm-hmm. So how does that... How did it go from NFL to books to speaking to training to gym ownership? Yeah. Oh, I mean, that's a because you're, you're a lot of weird young. Stuff. You're only like 34, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's a lot of that's, <laughs> that's a lot of get done. That's a lot of hustle. Yeah, man. I and work. My next I'm, is, uh, yeah, go ahead. I'll, I, I'll I, I think for me, the big thing is I got these dreams and and so for me if i sit back and tell you i'm going to be a guy that leads this charge and says i want to teach people to trust your hustle it would be very weird if i didn't do it myself <laughs> and so what i do is as i find these little like things that that spark my my interest and my passion i create from that i, I think things is i don't do it just because i i choose you know so, oh, this would be fun like I, years ago it was 2014 my mom passed away mm-hmm. and i was in the room and i was there when she took her last breath and it was this kind of weird realization that like I don't really on paper statistically exist. You know, if you take the amount of people that, you know, open a restaurant that's successful, you know, for 10 years, which I'm close to 10 years, this is actually I'm at 10 years now. Oh, wow. Um, at 10 years, like that's like point, you know, zero seven percent because most like people, just, their businesses fail. Uh, if you look at any prison in America, 75 percent of the inmates are former foster kids. So a majority of us Ooh. go to prison. And then on top of that, if you look at the NFL, I'm like point zero 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 something, you know, small number of human beings that get a chance to play in that sport, that level. Even football players is less than, you know, one percent. And so when I look at that, like statistically, I shouldn't exist. And I was, wow, why do I why do I exist as I do? And I realized it was because someone impacted me mm-hmm. and her impact was just on me and our family. But in that realization, I realize everybody impacts someone because we're all someone to someone, mm-hmm. whether it's, you know, someone to your brother or someone to your son. It doesn't matter who it is. You're someone to someone. And so I had this, this really clear picture of, you know, my mom impacted me and I want to impact people who impact, which is everybody in any way I can, because it's it's a way of me um, moving forward and giving back to the world what my mom gave to me in that unconditional 
of just love and care and compassion. And I have some weird skills that, that my creator gave me, whether it's speaking, talking and, and my athleticism. I don't know what it was. And so um, that pushed me into starting to say, OK, well, what is it I want to do and want to create? And that's what I started doing. I wanted to speak. I wanted to share. I wanted to you know, build co- programs where I could teach people these things. And so I started putting them out there. And I did all the safe work and the scary unsafe work of pretty much saying, hey, c- can I do this? And so, you know, part of it started with like, I want to find a way to get out of this this gym in a sense of not having to, to live here. Like I had to survive by doing that. And it wasn't it wasn't the love of my life anymore. And so I needed to get a contract. And so I went to this big corporation, multi-billion dollar corporation. I proposed an idea. And uh, two years later, they paid me a quarter million dollars, some random guy off the street <laughs> to consult and teach their people some stuff. And. But I was like, you know, I, I have free time now. I want to go and I want to share the story. So I started speaking in a right way. I joined some programs, got a speaking agent. Now I go to colleges and I work for corporations and I go in and do a lot of speeches and, and I teach. Then I was like, you know, I think I should probably write a book. So I secluded myself for seven days in Sparks, Nevada and wrote a book in seven days, made an autogram. Uh, I've, I've created an online course that was 12 weeks, did a live event in San Mateo and had like 73 people, some as far as England, come out and, mm-hmm. and work with me. Um, I've now created products with some of the biggest people in this industry. One guy is Brennan Burchard. Me and him have an actual program together. So yep. I, I have these weird ideas and I figure, well, at the end of the day, the only thing stopping me from getting this idea done is the information I don't have and the work that I, I'm not putting in. So if I put the work in and I find out what the right work is and then do that, it all comes to fruition. And so the, the cool thing is I've been able to, uh, to have some weird knack to be a really good teacher. And so what I do is when I do something and complete it, I can look back on it and simplify it down really easily to take out the most important steps and then teach people those steps and then guide them from the place where I say they're, they're dreaming to actually doing something. And so mm-hmm. that's kind of how it all came to fruition and how I've, I've done what I do. Every day is the same thing. I'm, I'm learning more and more, not because I have to, but I just I love to learn because I can pass it on to people. All right. I'm going to push back now. I'm going to push back because there's we'll probably back. some people saying – well, I could probably do that too if I had NFL money backing me up. Mm. Or I could probably do that too if I had a platform like the NFL or somebody like Brendan Burchard, you know, in my yeah. corner. Um, what else? What else? I could do that too if I was, how tall are you? I'm six foot one. If I was six one and 230 and 4% yeah. body fat. Yeah, it sounds good. Here's the NFL. Well, those money are the excuses, the right? I year. could do that too, right? Yeah. If. NFL money was gone the first year of me in the gym. I put a lot of money to build a brand new business, right? Mm-hmm. So that was gone. And then there was actually along that journey in 2013, I had torn my Achilles. I had $20 in the bank. And it was Christmas Eve. So I was Merry broke Christmas. upon broke, right? <laughs> I had, I couldn't buy my kids you Christmas. You broke and I had broke to, in. Dude, and I was divorced. I just oh. got through a divorce. Like I was, I was, I was horrible. So uh, the money thing that one's that one's uh, done because there wasn't okay. any money okay. and I was I was flat broke and then the next year is when I got the contract and that contract came from nothing more than me walking in somewhere and just talking to because when you get into to the realization of people say oh I don't have the NFL pedigree that all it does is gets me my foot in the door yep that, that doesn't that kind of no one works with me because I played in the NFL it's like oh what is it well, that's cool and they want to listen to more. If the next things I say or what I have as a human aren't of value to them, they're not going to pay me to help yes, them. That's right. It's not going to happen. Right. So when people look at me and say, well, I didn't play the NFL and have the, that's okay. Because regardless of whether you play the NFL or didn't, if you have any unique way of getting in the door to let somebody talk to you, you have just as much of a stand, stand up as I do. It's, there's no difference there. And then the aspect, I guess, of, of uh, you know, work with Brendan. The, the work with Brendan was a total accident and something I honestly didn't work for. All I did was just show up every day and, and help. So I, I went to his events and I, sh- I literally showed up to his events in 2000. It was 14 earlier that year. And I showed up as an attendee. Nobody knew me. I was absolutely nothing. I had no idea that this industry existed. Like literally none. Was, I was tucked away in a gym working on people's fitness. That was it. And so I show up at this event and there's like a thousand people. I'm like, what in the world is this? And so, you know, I just I listened. And what I did is as I took everything that he taught and I went, applied it. That's why I went to Sparks, Nevada for seven days, which is a, a, a hole in the wall, and wrote a book. Because he's like, go write a book. So I went and wrote a book. And, and then from there, the people on his staff somehow had heard about me. And uh, they'd asked me you know, to keep going to the events. And then they asked me to, to volunteer. Like, you, you want to come and volunteer for the events? I'm like, yeah, I'd love to. With the sole purpose of just being around greatness. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that's it. I don't, 
I don't want anybody to give me a lift up to the table. I'm going to earn my right up by everybody else. I want to sit next to people who know that I earned the right to get there. Now, at the same time, it's it would be stupid of me not to be around greatness to see how greatness operates. And so be able to see the interactions, how people speak. Like I didn't even meet him for the first, I think, like few months of being a volunteer. I was just kind of there. And I still this day, like it's not like I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's beats B. It's more of like, you know, this is just a regular person. I think the NFL kind of took off that facade of like amazing humans that are like mm-hmm. godly. So it's like it's just another guy, you know, but but what is, is great. And I want to see how that's done. And so, you know, even things like that, all they came from was me showing up and putting in the work before I knew it'd be successful. That's it. Dude, I love that. So, um, another another thing, uh, normalize to neutralize, and you just proved it. I remember the first time I flew private, I was mm-hmm. it was a big deal, and it's still pretty yeah. cool. But <laughs> yeah. but what I was amazed by, right? So I, I flew private. It was like this amazing ski trip, and you know a lot of fan. You know, you fly. There's some fancy pants, right? Yeah. In the world. So, and then I don't say that, I'm not saying that condescendingly. It's just, it was, you know, that's yeah, how they roll. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, it was like one of the, it was really a, a great trip. But one thing I marveled at was how normal it was for everyone. It, it mm-hmm. wasn't a big deal. And I'm not saying that they took it for granted and there was no gratitude and it was like snobbery or anything like that. It was just like, it, it like going to that plane was like going to like you going to your driveway and going to the car. You know? Mm-hmm. And and that and but what I liked about that was like, okay, wait, there's a lesson here. There's a lesson here. What's the lesson? Mm-hmm. And the lesson was like, everything's normal. Mm-hmm. Because it exists. You know what yeah. I mean? If it exists in the world, it might be great. It might not, but it's normal. Yeah. Right? Because it's here. The only thing that's like abnormal is probably stuff that doesn't exist yet. Mm-hmm. Right? Right? Yeah. The electric car, you know, the before the Tesla was the Tesla, okay, that was like wow, out of this world, but now it's here. It's normal. It's normal. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. it's in people's garages. And so, but I think we do that to people, I think we do that to our dreams, I think we do that to you know, things that we kind of put up on a pedestal, whatever that is. And and so what happens is it becomes this this huge mountain we have to climb as yeah. opposed to just like going, all right, well, if I just walk that direction or run, but if I just go that mm-hmm. direction and keep stepping, mm-hmm. I'll get there. And, and, the, and the way you're talking about this is like, well, the NFL money was gone. And Brendan uh, didn't even meet him. And he's just a dude. And it was just like, and I just went and wrote a book. It's not... It's normal. It's just yeah. what you do. You just put one foot in front of the other and go. And yeah, I'm guessing sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. But that's oh yeah, the point. that's part of life, right? All right. Mm-hmm. So does Anthony Trucks get tired? Because that's because people who work, right? The entrepreneur, the the person yeah. who's putting in that forty, fifty, sixty, right? And then they have yeah. the family X Y Z one two three. Does yeah. Anthony Trucks get tired? Well, I never work, man, so I never get tired. It's oh. not work. <laughs> <laughs> no, I uh, go there. Go further. You know, that. at the end of the day, I, I think there's always this level of what drains, what fulfills. And I think what, when I hear people like they say, like, "What do you do?" I, I spend you know a good chunk of hours. I'm you know if I could put in you know 16 hours doing this, I, I'd I'd do it every day. And there's days when I've actually done that back to back days, and there's their faces like, "Oh, that's good. that sucks." And I'm like, "No, no, no you realize." You don't like what you do. So the thought of what you do for 16 hours sucks. Don't project on I me. Love, yeah. <laughs> I love what I do. So for me, like this is part of my work. Like I, when I'm done, I get to go on my whiteboard back behind me and, and create. I get to talk to clients. Like well, in a minute, I'm going to get off and, and work with a person who needs some website. This stuff, it excites me. And so I do get tired. And, and when I get tired, it's not tired because I'm just drained and I hate what I'm doing. It's tired because I literally have to go so I have enough energy to keep serving at the level I want to. And so, yeah, you naturally as human beings can't run forever. But I also realize that if I want to perform at the greatest level I can, I have to be fully rested, fully energized. And so for me, I put in just as much effort to make sure I get rest. So when I am awake, I'm giving the most of myself to the world. There we go. And for the young athletes out there who always think they air quote need to be training or doing something, the, re- the rest and recovery the rest. Is, part, is part of the work. 
Train hard, rest hard, man. If you don't rest as hard as you train, your body will never adapt and get better. You just keep beating yourself. Yeah, yeah. Man, I could talk this stuff forever. So you have Trust Your Hustle. I want I want everyone to be able to hire you, reach you, connect with you, uh, purchase yeah. your products as best they can. So, And then I'm going to ask you one more question, and then we're going to close it out. So how can people find you, connect with you, support you, and help you serve more? Best way to go to trustyourhustle.com and take the Thrive Assessment. It's a, it's a it's a pretty much an assessment that breaks up the four quadrants of, of humans that I've I've realized I've worked with over my lifetime and and it, you know which category you're in and then after that I'll introduce you to the things that I do to help you and improve your thrive type to go from surviving to thriving. Okay, all right, trustyourhustle.com. Okay, last question. We ask this to everyone on the Gold Medal Mindset. What's one thing you wish every human being knew? On a cellular mm. level. On a cellular level? On a cellular level. I, like if they were born with this one nugget, then yeah. everything would just be that much better. What's the one thing? Oh, here's what I – and this is actually something that I did not come up with. I heard this from a guy named Bo Eason, and I loved how he stated it. Literally every single thing you want in life is already yours. Everything. I don't care if it's the relationship you want, the house you want, the car you want, the money, the, no matter what it is, everything you want is already yours. The only reason you get it is if you choose to stop before you get there. That's it. Damn. Anthony Trucks, yeah. yo, I trust our paths will cross in the future. Maybe we'll share a stage either way. Um, yeah, let's keep in touch. We'll have to have you back on for sure because I think there's a lot more to your story. And I want, I want, I want the people to uh, – to, See it unfold. All that, yeah, man. All those normal, you, amazing things you're doing. The funny thing is, today is the uh, it's my 1,000th nightly night. I do a video every single night okay. for 90 seconds, and tonight's my 1,000th straight day doing it. Woo. And so, uh, yeah, it was actually one of those things from years ago with the Brashard event. It's like do something and just don't stop it. So like, all right, I'm gonna do a video every day. I turned into every day, uh, and so what I did is this week I relaunched like a condensed kind of really streamlined version of what Trust Your Hustle is. And so the the Thrive Academy is something I'm launching. And so it's actually perfect that today was the day that we rescheduled. I nice. think it all just fits there. Yes, yes. I t- <laughs> so, so, so full <laughs> transparency, I sent I sent this guy uh, to get on the schedule. And then he gets on the schedule. I'm like, sorry, man, can't do that day. <laughs> can't do that day. <laughs> yeah. And then um, so, so yeah, face. It happens. Face. Uh, Hand in my face, foot in my mouth, all of the above. But um, but that's how it goes because that's normal. It's all good. I don't all right, mind all man. that goes on. Well, I appreciate it. And, uh, and yeah, uh, we'll have you on again. Thanks a lot. Very welcome. Thanks for taking the time to mine for gold on the Gold Medal Mindset Podcast. Let's keep the conversation going on Twitter at RealDrJRich or on the web at DrJasonRichardson.com. That's DrJasonRichardson.com. Take care and have a great day.